I love that we all come together to support one another, to help really drive and um, boost the industry that we are in. Thanks so much for joining us today on our final webinar of the week. Um, for those of you who have not been involved in one of these webinars before, just a couple of house rules before we get going. Um, we will have the opportunity to ask uh, Mary questions at the end of the session, so please pop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and those of you who are watching via Facebook Live, you also have the opportunity to ask questions if you just pop um, a comment in the chat uh, underneath the video. So, um, hi Mary, thanks so Hello. much. Hello, how are you Emma? Really well, how are you? I'm great, thank you. I have my coffee, lovely and sunny in the UK. Well, thanks for joining us so early, that is a uh, commitment. <laughs> Part of the professional beauty family, that's what I have to do, isn't it? Part of the rules. Well, we're thrilled to have you. So, um, before we get going, for those of you who don't know you, um, I think it'd be a great opportunity to um, introduce yourself. Before, okay, uh, so I'm Mary Pratt, or as many people know me as Pra. So I'm the founder of The Caviar Spoon. So we are a brand which is based in Dubai with coverage globally. Uh, we're about to go through a rebrand, but we are what I call brand collaborators. So we bring together brands in experiences and cross-marketing opportunities and help you as business owners and managers grow and save the lovely things around uh, unnecessary overspend on social media and marketing. So your background has a lot to do with, with where this kind of collaborative idea came from. So, so tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, for uh, 20 years, so I started very young, I was in recruitment. So basically set up greenfield agencies across the world, um, had my own business in the UK, worked in Australia, and it was all around bringing together personalities into businesses. So it was the same thing, we were matchmaking. You know, it isn't just a job, you're bringing in a behavior into a business which needs to align with a culture. Uh, and then I spotted the opportunity to do this brand to brand. It's the same thing, you know, it's a, a, a marriage, a matchmake, um, you know, with collaborations, the secret is you're sharing a space to increase the value of your own goods and services, but no one loses an identity. So that's, you know, thanks to my recruitment background, it's really brought me into this space uh, where I can really, um, I can headhunt and spot potential, uh, something I'm very good at and I'm very good at connecting the dots. Very simple stuff, but uh, it works. So amazing. So this session is obviously on collaboration, which is key for, you know, even times like this, but beyond. So um, tell us um, more about the, the subject you're going to touch on today. What, you know, what is a collaboration and what, what, what data can you, can you highlight to, to those listening? Yeah, I mean, with regards to collaborations, it's not rocket science. It's been going around for years. So you have your influencer to brand collaborations. You have your brand to brand collaborations, but it's all very siloed a number of times. People do things in silos. Um, but it works, you know, it increases revenue. There was an American Express report came out and it went across, I believe, 15 industries um, and the results and it was within the SME market, but it still works in, in global corporates as well. But it is stating that higher collaborations will increase financial growth for up to 64 percent versus lower. And we did a lot of data before investing in the platform which goes live in September, but the data was wrapped around this figure that you have got to collaborate to really grow. But post where we are at at the moment, it will be pretty much non-compromise and it will even include collaborating with your competitors because even though people may not like to hear it, sometimes your competitors know more than you. So you need to come together uh, and really 
join forces. So there's a lot of data around this and we're really excited about it. And, you know, my whole purpose is to help businesses, whether you own the business or running the business, to, to find out more ways about how to do it. Because sometimes it's right under our nose most of the time and we, we're too busy and we only look at these things when there's a certain crisis or a recession or it's quiet. Uh, but this should be part of the strategy moving forward in any business. Cool. So how, how does this look in practical terms? Oh, God, my goodness. You can be there's so many ways I and mean, I can go through some certain ways as a salon owner or a business which you could do. So collaborations comes in all shapes and shapes and sizes. So the obvious one, which so many people forget, is within your salon or within your spa or within your business, you have sales opportunities right under your nose at any given moment in time. So if you walk through a salon, for example, and you go through that customer experience, what do we have? We have teas, we have coffees, we have those biscuits, which we really should get rid of those biscuits. I don't know what those biscuits are, the caramel ones, not good. <laughs> but you look at that and I always say to someone when I'm coaching business owners, when you buy those products, you may buy in bulk. So you may buy from a big tea brand, and I've noticed it in a lot of salons and spas in Dubai, big tea brands. And my question is, do you think that very large tea brand cares if their product's in your spa or not? So they have a great following on social media, they have great people who use them, but do you think they really care? And the answer is probably no. Whereas if you go for local businesses, or brands which align with your brand and they're privately owned, they will care. And instantly you have a collaboration with a supplier who will do things such as posting. So there's a brand, a tea brand in Dubai and it's not a pitch, I just know who they are and they've got a great reputation, but Adventure, they've got a great, great reputation. They've got great alliances, they've got great followers. Now, a lot of those followers, I bet if you looked at the demographics and the age, et cetera, they would align with a lot of salons and a lot of spas and they're privately owned. So you want to have a product like that within your spa or salon and come up with a deal with the supplier saying, can you post about us? We'll post about you. Will you post about us? You'll then have followers, which then become clients. It's a, it's a numbers game. So that's an example of supplier collaboration. The second one we can talk about is the customer experience collaboration. So I come into a salon or spa, it's 12 o'clock, 12 to two. Guess what, I may be hungry. And I'd love to also have that extra piece of my reservation saying, would you like to have lunch? We're gonna have lunch prepared for you. And your collaboration is then with, for example, Jones or Tom and Serge or whatever you want to do, which is near you. They deliver, they have a great following. That's the customer experience and also another collaboration. Um, you've got close alliances. So if you are a hair salon and you may just be doing hair and nails, et cetera, you can create an alliance. Um, now I'm not gonna mention any names in this because it's gonna be quite obvious if I do, but an alliance could be hair, nails, we need a spa. Also, we need a day hammam. And let's think about a tanning specialist. Who is a great tanning specialist? And without mentioning names, there's one in Dubai who's a celebrity tanning specialist who has the most amazing database of local high-end people who will pay for everything beautiful. Now you can create an alliance that way where, for example, you then create a membership package. So I go into your salon as an example, and I could buy five blow dries with five tanning sessions and five facials. And it's done as an alliance. And as a package, I get 20% off because I'm a great payer. And then you've got continuous business because if you create that collaboration, you have to create a, a deal between yourselves. So if there's three people involved, all three have to be committed and you'll naturally then assess how it's going. 
And remember, some of these collaborations may not work, but I would certainly want to be a brand who gives it a go as opposed to seeing someone else do it. That's the way of business. Never be afraid to say it didn't work. You have to do it. And us Brits, in, for example, don't like to say things don't didn't work. But, you know, that's the, that's the way we grow as a business. So you've got your close alliances. You can then expand upon that as a business and think about companies or brands which may align with you. So it might be some extra lunch venues and you can offer your customers discounts. And in return, the, these lunch venues can post about you. So those are called like wide collaborations. Um, going on to another one, internal staff. OK, so. You need to collaborate with your staff. And I see a lot of salon owners or managers and they feel as if everything has to be on their shoulders. So again, these are obvious things, but for example, social media, you should be having so much video content on your social media pages, including lives. Now, if you are a nail bar in Dubai, there's only so many lives you can do about nails. Okay, I'm gonna watch you a couple of times and go, great, that's, that's wonderful. So you start creating collaborations with like-minded brands and people who will come on and do a live with you. So it could be, let's talk about, I don't know, nails and uh, hair. For, I'm just making it up at the moment. So let's, let's talk about this. That's a live. You can piggyback off the, the salons, uh, the hair specialists. They only do hair. You piggyback off their followers. They piggyback off yours. You then may do another topic so, um, you know, you'll find different products and different people to speak to. So that's a social collaboration. Um, go on to collaborations around PR and networking. And this isn't a pitch to professional beauty, but as I say, any brand who is not attending these types of webinars or are not attending these types of networks, you're missing the most obvious trick one learning from people and two it's great PR okay so if you can get a piece with professional beauty and it's something of interest and a good topic that's free PR because people start seeing it people like it they watch it they read it they then come to you so all of these things in that bracket are very practical but they could be done today and within your business plan you know, you have your p &L, you have your sales and marketing campaign. There needs to be two specific areas extra. That's video content. And that's a different story. But 80% of people will watch your lives more than seeing a poster on your social media fact. And they want to see people. They don't want to see just posters and prettiness. They, you also need a collaboration strategy and you can break it down into internal customer, close alliances, PR. And the other two big ones, which we can talk about in a little while, is events and experience. So uh, you can still do events. There's a great online retreat, which I attended last week in America, where they pulled all the people together, the speakers, the yoga uh, professionals, the, um, and we did it online. That was great. And I still paid for it. Uh, and the other one is obviously cross marketing which we can go through later on so they're the two two biggies which need more strategic thinking the ones i've just mentioned you could get your team together today and start those amazing so do you have um you know i know you're going to touch on those two angles later on but do you have examples of those that you've um used recently or have collaborated on recently that were a huge success that you could share best practices of yeah, I mean, we had one for um, an event, for example. So Caesars Palace in Dubai, they contacted me. Now, I'm not an events person, but sometimes we do manage services and they contacted me with the objective. They need to create a buzz within the hotel. So to create more people coming into the hotel and creating more people coming into the spa and being aware of the products. They didn't want to just do 
come into Dubai, you know, come into the hotel, let's have a hundred people. They wanted to have an experience. So we looked at it and firstly, the product in the spa was Carol Joy London. Now I'm friends with Carol Hatton and she's a wonderful person, but what they were having an issue with, I believe, is that a product with Carol Joy London, that's not the thing which sells. People want to see Carol Hatton. So she created that product over years, found a golden millet oil. She's fantastic, she's personable. And when you meet Carol, you naturally fall in love with the product, but you don't naturally fall in love with the white, white box and the gold wording to start off with. So Carol came across, to Beho uh, came across to Dubai. We also wanted to have someone different. So we pulled across, um, and I don't really like using the word celebrity, but she has an A-list client base and her name is Sue Minjalif and she's a microblader in London. But microblading is a very big thing in the Middle East and Suman has a very, very strong network of Emirati ladies, Saudis, Shakers, celebrities, on her database, which obviously Caesar's Palace would like as well. So Carol and Suman flew across and we did a barter with the hotel. So the hotel hosted the two ladies for three nights, all expenses paid. Carol would be talking about her story and, and the inspirational story. Suman would be doing it from an emerging level because Carol's been in business um, Longer than, longer than Suman, so they could bounce off each other. And Suman would work in the spa. She would only be doing normal uh, uh, brows because she couldn't do the blading, but she'd do the brows, she'd bring in her followers, etc. So that was the concept. Then we needed to think about what it actually looks like. So we looked at the hotel and we found a most magnificent, as you know, magnificent suites and penthouses. So we created, and it's very rich, you know, Caesars is great, lots of gold, lots of glamour. So we created uh, the lotions and potions afternoon tea with Caesars. So the deal was we'd have these ladies come in, talk about inspiring stories. We had the angle around a very, very upmarket afternoon tea. The budget for the F&B, so the event was actually split up. So the spa had a certain budget and F&B um, had their budget. So we could spread the budgets across the hotel. And we agreed that it was only uh, Tattinger Champagne for four hours. It was only high-end wines. And it's moving away from what Dubai does. And it, they always, always go big. And I've always said, go boutique and small, it's classy. So we had um, 38 people and the agreement with those 38 guests, which the hotel were a bit edgy about to start off with, I said no to all media. And I said no to all influences. And the hotel said, well, pra, you know, media, we need media, we need media, and we need influencers. I said, if you have all media, they are unreliable. So you are gonna have empty, de empty tables in this most amazing penthouse. If you have influencers, a lot of them don't have money. So they want to have paid services, but you may get a few posts, but you also want to increase revenue. So what we're gonna do is a third, a third, a third, and it's always good, you guys can do this all time. So a third reliable media, a third really good content creators and strong assessed influencers. And a game of influencers, you can track and test how many followers are genuine versus bots. And you can send a message after this and I'll tell you the name of it because I can't remember it. Social Steez, I think. And the third thing, we're gonna have high-end working women. So women who are working in jobs of a salary of 40,000 dirham upwards a month. So that's the client base. We then looked at how we're gonna get the invites. So again, going against all of Dubai, the experience was very rich. So we had um, gold key cards created, Caesar's Palace. We had them hand-delivered 
to the people and they had to do an RSVP within a week. And if the RSVP wasn't through to me, you were no longer allowed to come. So I was very strict, um, as you know, Em, because um, <laughs> as it is everyone. So we had the we had the afternoon tea. So Suman flew in, Carol flew in, and uh, we also finished it off. We needed a photographer, so we did a, a great barter with a great photographer. So for the value of um, what he would usually charge us we could give him a voucher to use the hotel. So it was a great barter. And he was happy with that because barters work and we'll go through this later. We also had the most amazing experience with Alyssa Flowers and I can't thank Alyssa enough. Uh, she works with all the luxury hotels. She had over 1400 roses and flowers of all sorts flown into Dubai and made the most experience, uh, amazing experience with a floral wall floral experience in the bathtubs in this most amazing suite so it took amazing photos so everyone wanted to take the photos and they were naturally posting it they wanted to be lying in the bathtub with a glass of champagne they wanted to do that and the long and story short we had a hundred percent hit ratio of guests turning up to that event we had one person who was late and they were 20 minutes late and the butler had to come and get me before they came in because my rule is if you let me down once in an event you'll never come to another one again so that's a dubai rule i don't care about this uh, dubai time it doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for the people i work for um and the revenue we sold 4500 just in that lunch time in carol joy products suman was packed out for three days she was pulling in the likes of Caroline Stanbury into the hotel who hadn't seen the hotel. We had out of those guests, 15 guests who returned to the hotel in one shape of uh, one way or another, whether it's pool events or staying at the hotel. Um, there's 25,000 dirhams worth of alcohol and drinks, uh, drinks of all sorts, uh, paid for in the bar downstairs post the afternoon tea. And the coverage was fantastic. Um, the comments were fantastic. That is an example of an experience. So we're going to try and start removing the word event and making it in it to an experience. OK, because an experience is what keeps people excited and keeps people loyal. So even if you do an experience in your salon, make it special. Right, cut down the numbers. I don't care what anyone says, numbers do not work. Make it special where people feel special and they will want to attend. So that is a key example of what happened. And we can send the video of um, very happy people after this webinar to show you all. Yeah, it's a great example of an amazing collaboration and all forces from, you know, the flowers to the photography to the, the, the F&B, the product, like everything was all bar to do and it can be done. And it goes to show with the numbers at the end of that, that actually the, the hotel, as a result of providing all of this, had revenues coming in as, as an effect. So Yeah, and that's an example, Emma. You know, with regards to hotels, um, yes, sometimes you know, the spas aren't owned by the hotels and this hotel, you know, it's operated by different places. It's a, a group effort. You know, the amount of revenue which is lost by non-collaborations between hotel and spa is unbelievable and by doing these type of events where you uh, experiences where you're spreading the cost across different budget uh, different departments it does pay off and you have to try it you know it's again it's non-compromise and i can't stress enough about this it's non-compromise that you stay in your silo you have to spread your wings and give it a go yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess in a, such a saturated market that the salons and the spas, you know, have in the, in the Middle East, do you have any examples or suggestions on how a salon maybe in particular can make an exclusive membership or, or make it an exclusive experience for their key top paying customers, for example? Any suggestions or ideas? Yeah, I mean, with regards to, say, your returning clients, it amazes me how many salons which are privately owned where you don't actually see the owner 
some of them are working on the floor. So if you're working on the floor, it's great. But if you are a returning guest, you could create experiences for the inner circle. So the biggest thing is, you know, when I was in recruitment, my number one issue was loyalty. So, you know, I'd say to my customers, um, it would never be, are you happy with the service? The question you should always ask your customers is, how can we keep you loyal? Because people are fickle and you might have a salon to the left and then a salon which just looks a bit more trendier opens to the right. But if you haven't been keeping your customers intrigued, they will probably go to the right. So they may come back again. So you can do experiences where you can uh, come up with different ideas for your loyal clients. It might be, you know, uh, the owner doing a sort of a, a, a supper club. So it might do a supper club in the salon and they kind of, you know, make a table with big church candles. And I'm just making this up off the top of my head. If it actually is a good idea though. <laughs> But you bring in some lovely food, you invite your people, you know, you have your owner of the business or the, or the manager, you know, really mingling, getting to know the clientele, asking them about advice, you know, what, what else could we be doing? Um, you know, whilst they're having a supper club, you may be doing in a collaboration with a, a robe company where they come in and say, actually, let's, we're going to do a bedtime supper club. So we put these luxurious robes on and they could be having some supper, but after that, they might be having some treatments. So it's a proper supper club. And we've, we've done, you know, I've, I've worked on a concept in a very lovely members bar in London doing this. So the robe brand is promoting their lovely robes. They, the ladies take them away, they're posting. It's not just people talking in the salon, you know, candles going on, you know, it's lovely. It's kind of, it feels, makes you feel special. That's something you could do. Now, half of people could be laughing, going, I'd never do that. Why? And I'll always ask the question, why? Because if you have good collaborations and it's a good idea and no one else is doing it, why wouldn't you give it a go? Absolutely. And uh, that exclusivity will help with the loyalty of that returning customer by making them feel special as well. Exactly. Collaborations, um, whatever you do from an experience great. point, is emotional intelligence. So it's making sure that you are tapping in to your customers, or your client audience, their emotional intelligence. And you should be doing that with your staff as well. You know, it's another, another story. But if you tap into your staff's EI, you will find so many amazing things because... The most, you know, I look at social media with live collaborations. The amount of knowledge with your staff is incredible. You may have a budding photographer within those therapists. You may have um, a hairstylist who has the largest social media accounts on, on his or her own. And you need to be tapping into the brains you're hiring because there's so many ideas. And when you start doing this, it's exciting. There's no such thing as a silly question and there's no such thing as a silly idea. Put it on paper and decide if it's doable. If it's, no, it's not doable, it could be. And start mapping out your collaboration strategy over the year. Okay, great, great idea, great suggestion. So um, this, so you've obviously given us an example of a great collaboration, but do barters really work? Yes. Now I'm going to go, there's going to be lots of business consultants saying, I can't believe Mary Pratt has even suggested doing something on a barter. If you like the idea of the barter and it works for you, why not do it? So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. You are a photographer and you've been approached by a salon to do 20 high-res photos, 20 high-res photos, a one-minute video, and um, two hours of your time. And that's going to be for the Candlelit Supper Club, which you're going to be doing. One salon's got to do it, please. You've got to do it. So you approach the, you approach the photographer. 
Now, the photographer will either want money straight away or if you said to that photographer, what would it cost in a normal day for you to do 20, uh, 20 photos, a one minute video, very simple, no massive cuts, couple of testimonials and two hours of your time. And that photographer comes back and says, or oh, it'd be um, uh, 2000 dirham. That's what I'll charge. Right, I'm just gonna, I'm making it up. Some of them are extortionate, which you need to cut down anyway. You could say, well, um, would you consider a 2000 dirham voucher? You can use it over, over the year. It could go towards um, your colors. It could go towards beauty treatments. Um, we're, we're doing a collaboration with, um, we're a hair salon, but we're doing a collaboration with the spa down the road. So you can use it in their spa if you want to and, and you send your wife there or your husband there. What do you think? Now, if I'm a photographer who likes your brand and I like to have my hair done and I like to go to a spa, I can pass it to my children perhaps, and it's two hours of my time, and I also get credited with all of the people in your spa. And because you're doing such amazing collaborations, you've got so much PR, why would I not do a barter? So when you think about it, it has to have a, um, it has to be good for both parties. If it's not good for both parties, that's why barters don't work. But when it's good for parties and you are happy to do that on the odd occasion, it's a numbers game. You may do three barters per month and the rest of them you do uh, paid work. But I do barters because it works for me. And you can look at, um, you know, we have a, there's a, fa a fabulous illustrator in London called uh, Charlotte Posner. Now she's done barters and paid, it works. I have someone in LA called Erin Van Buren. She's a famous writer. Um, she has an um, Instagram page called Paper Crumbs. Look at her. I'm doing a barter with Erin. She's writing my quotes and caviar spoon taglines for our new platform in return for global exposure because we've got a big PR campaign. So that works for her. It works for me. So barters do work in the right circumstances but you have to be fair and you both have to come up with an agreement which works on both sides. Okay, amazing. And I think it's, it's all about knowing your client and if your client has something they can offer, that's the opportunity there to really tap into collaborating. Exactly. Um, a win-win situation. Yeah, everything's a win-win um, if you do it right. Yeah. <laughs> so where, where does it go wrong and does it, does it go wrong with collaborations? Absolutely. It can go facially wrong. You can have, if you look at large companies, like large brands, they can really mess up brand, um, collaboration. So they think you can do a collaboration with a famous person or a big influencer and it works. It doesn't work if you haven't got meaning behind it. All right. So collaborations have to have meaning and thought put behind it. It's a strategy. So collaborations, if you think about Uber and Spotify, they had a strategy behind it. You wait for your car, you can download Spotify, you can choose your playlist, go into Uber, fantastic. Um, you know, with regards to Remoa suitcases and Off-White, they had a strategy, you know, suitcases with a trendy fashion brand, that works. But there's so many which don't work. Another one with a beauty is uh, um, the Crayons, Cronola, uh, uh, the other crane brand and uh, yeah so they collaborated with Clinique to make the chubby lipsticks so it's crayons it smells like what you remember you know that worked but the collaborations which don't work is when you just think you can put together something um, you know and that's you know it's going to work because it's a famous brand or it's a big influencer and they've got thousands of followers no because they, it just doesn't go like that so where it goes wrong is no strategy, no meaning and no purpose. It goes back to everything I ask is the why. So why are you doing it? It's having the emotional intelligence behind it where people really buy into it. 
the biggest thing is also um, you've got to trust the brands you are collaborating with. I'm really strict on this one. And I've had a couple of fatal errors just testing it. And I'll say one thing right here, right now. It does not matter who they are, what they do, how big their audience is, if they do not respect your brand as much as their, um, their own. So if they are looking after their brand and they're not respecting yours the same level as their own, do not do it. And if you get any, any inkling that they're doing, um, they're just being unreliable, cut it because it will end up being a very painful experience. And the unfortunate thing which I've seen in what I do is I find amazing brands and really unreliable people who either own the brand, who run the brand. And it's such a shame because when you're unreliable and you agree for an example, a collaboration where two or three parties both have to post on their social media page, um, a post tagging everyone in, and two are doing it and one can't be bothered, they're just piggybacking and going on the ride, it leaves a very bitter taste in people's mouths and that's where it can go wrong. So you have to be very clear, even if it's a barter agreement, be very clear on what you get and what they get. And if you think they're doing the barter but they're not putting the effort in, again, don't do it because it has to be 100% all in uh, and there's a awful expression which I use it's not rude but there's an expression which is you can't be half pregnant you're either pregnant or you are not pregnant you can't be there's no such thing as half so when you do these types of things you are all in or you're not all in so you create the experiences you pitch to each other you sell the idea for each other the person who creates the concept will probably do a little bit more work and they need to be the lead collaborator. So they're like the organizer, pushing it forward, striving it forward. Uh, but yes, if you don't trust someone, it doesn't matter who they are. And I've said no to some pretty big brands who have a lot of clout, but I know the effort to get them to do what I want them to do is too much hard work. So we say goodbye. <laughs> Love it. Um, I was, yeah, a question that came to my mind is how do you um, measure the ROI with these key barter deals or the collaborations you do? How yeah. do you measure that? The obvious ones, I mean, firstly, you can look at your social media spikes. So I know that when we do lives with other brands, I can instantly see a spike on my insights. And remember, social media followers, they can convert to people walking through your door if your audience is in the same same region. So, you know, it's collaborations for the nations. You know, you kind of do the stuff within your uh, on your doorstep. If you want global exposure because it's goods or, you know, it's products, that's fine. But social media is one. You can also look at things, uh, really practical things like um, if you've had a collaboration where the party was 30 people who came to the collaboration or the event, for example, you could see who returns within a three month window. That's another good uh, measure. You can also measure the success by also a you know, simple uh, online survey, you know, quick mobile link. Would you come in? What do you suggest? You can also um, do a referral program. So you could um, measure the success of any referrals from the people who came to an event or an experience. So there's lots of ways of doing it. But again, some of them, you have to accept that some may not work. But if you do the thinking behind the strategy to start off with, they will be successful. Because you thought about the purpose, the meaning, the whys. So it's looking at really, really practical ways of measure. Social engagement in terms of I really enjoyed it. Referrals and ask them to say, look, if you refer people, you'll get 10% off when you come back in. But you need to say the word salon one so we know. And who returns from the guests? 
who came in, because you might invite for your guests, you might invite 50% who are loyal guests. And you might say to those loyal guests, you can bring one person who you feel could work within our inner circle. So you could test it that way too. Lots of different ways. We could do another ROI session because there's lots of different ways you could do that. I think that would be interesting. I think this comes on to another question that someone else has asked about influencers. And what are your, what's your perspective on influencers? Should they be used as a bar to deal? Um, how do you tell a good influencer from a bad one? And I know you mentioned there's bots and, and various platforms you can use to. Yeah. To do so so what, what are your views on, on influencers as a whole? Influencers, definitely, you need to use them as part of your strategy. Don't put them as all, as your, all of your strategy. Where it's moving, content creators tend to be like the more, you know, they're, they're creating proper strategic content. Influencers are good in terms of they do have a knack of finding followers. You know, they're hunting around and it's good to do. Should you pay an influencer? I, I believe that some can do paid, but I think you can also create uh, great barters of influencers. But again you could create an experience where you collaborate with a number of influencers to create an experience so rather than having a random influencer coming into the salon another one coming into the salon another one coming into the salon when you actually work out the revenue or the time your therapist or stylist is spending with those people it may be better to create an experience within the salon or, or the spa which is so delightful we're talking with uh, we're talking with a very high end hotel at the moment where their villa is fifteen thousand dollars a night, and we're saying rather than spending, allowing the random influence to come in each weekend, which is still a thousand dirhams uh, dollars a night, do something where you create a competition where the best people have the most amazing experience. So choose wisely how you i believe it's called social stees but i'll check but there are certain websites you can actually check the authenticity of the influence you're using uh, but it's quite common sense as well if you're looking at a photo and i got 4500 likes i would put my money on the fact that it's probably a lot of uh, paid followers you also want to look at the photos and see what comments are coming through are people interacting or is it just a post? And believe me, there's lots of pretty pictures in Dubai in particular. It's all very nice having a pretty picture, but we need some more substance behind it. And that's why I keep telling these influencers and I'm training a lot up in, in video content. And, uh, you know, I need credible influencers on our platform in September because I will be passing out barters so I've got a brand at the moment who wants to come into Dubai. I've chosen, I've handpicked the influencer on a barter who I'll be using, but I've also agreed an, a, a contract with that person to so be very specific. So if they're coming in for um, a hydrofacial and then they're going to have a, you know, a full body massage and use of a beach all day if you're a spa, you want to be asking, what do you give us? So, oh, we'll post something. Okay, no, I want specifics. So it's a 500 word blog. Okay, fine. So we're going to proofread that with marketing. It's going to be a static post or a, cat, a photo within a week, posting our hotel or spa, tagged with these things. It's going to be two stories whilst you're in the spa and it's going to be a post um, one week after the experience. So you're really, really specific. Um, and the rest of it is suck it and see. You have to give these guys a go. The, uh, the other thing I'm going to just say on that is I'm going to put my, um, I'm going to hold the flag up for emerging people. Don't go for the people who are just big, right? Go for the people who have 2,000, 1,000 followers. Look at them because those people are working damn hard organically and it takes time to organically build your followers. If you like what they have to say and they're really trying, then give them a go. But don't just go for the big boys. 
And that goes for everything, you know, products. We need to be looking at emerging products, giving emerging products a go, not just going for the big boys. Same thing. Yeah, great point. Okay, so before, before we end the session, is there anything, any other key kind of bits that you want to share on this subject? I can't stress enough, you know, I've helped businesses over the years grow and, you know, I've worked with a lot of greenfield businesses and coached managers and owners. I can't stress enough that you have to give these things a go. I've always, you know, used the expression, you may know what you know, but do you do or do you just keep what you know as a, as a, you know, is information. So you need to actually implement and carry on. Um, I think these types of webinars, for example, there's lots of people on here. A lot of them could be because they're just great and they want to learn. Some are worried about what the new future holds. Okay. You should always be learning and always be collaborating. So make it a new way of life in your business. Be creative, be open, and just do it. Brilliant, brilliant advice. Okay, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, My pleasure. All of you who have been listening and watching, and if you have any more questions, then do um, follow Mary. Um, it's at the caviar spoon is your Instagram handle, is that correct? Yeah, at the caviar spoon, yes, yep. Uh, Mary is, is doing her own, actually, Instagram lives every Tuesday on various topics. We have lots of them coming up, yes. We have, a, we have so many fabulous people coming in. And right. at Instagram live, when you're interviewing with people, it's actually a lot more interesting in talking to, you, talking to yourself, in effect, for half an hour. <laughs> I know, I know the feeling. So, yeah. Um, any questions and you know you want to reach Mary directly then I'd suggest that that's the best way if not pop me an email and I'd be happy to connect you um so yeah thank you everyone for tuning in thank you Mary so much for your time um My pleasure. and we hope to see you back in Dubai very soon yes I know I can't wait I'm jealous of all these hair salons opening and I've got a the most dire route so first world issues but I will see you all soon and thank you very much who's a logged in and spent the time to listen to Emma and I. Thank you, Mary. And thank you everyone for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.